I was told to be careful up here. I think I made it. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. So this work is called Tidal Momentum, and this is a continuation of a metaphor that my co-authors and I uh, started called the Shifting Tide Recommendations for Incorporating uh, Science Communication into Graduate Training. And here we're talking about science communication training opportunities that meet early career scientist recommendations. So it's a bit of our initial paper in the LNO Bulletin and then uh, giving you some examples of uh, training that meets our recommendations. I'd like to give a shout out to my co-authors, Alicia Wood Charlson, Bradley Toller, who's somewhere passing things out, uh, Patrick Shuri, and Jennifer Oker, uh, and also to our initial co-authors as well. So as you may be aware, PhD students are largely not going into uh, faculty research positions. So the data varies, but for biology, for example, recent data shows that 14% of tenure track of uh, PhD students are in tenure track research positions within five years. Uh, the rest of this pie chart, lovingly named everyone else, are those who are going into government, NGOs, industry, uh, and other non-research careers. Uh, and most of whom are gainfully employed. Some really important research by Sauerman and Roach, I think, about career preferences, talks about uh, how, despite this data, most advisors think that the dominant career choice is an academic research position. In addition to that, they're more likely to encourage academic research positions than any other choice, and this is despite the fact that, by the same authors, career preference by PhD students uh, a sizable and growing portion of them are choosing non-academic careers, meaning not, they're not just getting them, that's one of their first choices. So in light of this, it's perhaps unsurprising that a number of authors have been calling for a shift in graduate training. For example, Hansen et al., also in the LNO Bulletin, said, as academia becomes the new alternative career for ecology PhDs, graduate programs and institutions must adapt to reflect this reality. Furman et al. in 2017 said, our lack of action in providing training for non-traditional career choices is shocking because non-traditional career paths are not alternative. So we decided to zero in in our initial paper on science communication of one, as one aspect of this uh, needed professional development in graduate training. And among other questions, we asked, what is the, what is the perceived importance of science communication training? We came up with three recommendations out of this work, which, we can, which can be summed up as a challenge to align training with priorities identified by graduate students who will pursue a diversity of career paths. Today, we're also looking at the early responded, responders, those who are changing their graduate training in light of recent job market changes and student career preferences, to ask what we can learn from programs that are already doing this training. So to get from here to there, I'm going to talk just briefly about the survey tool and our results and tell you about the three recommendations. From there, some examples of training that's, uh, that is being done uh, around science communication and grad programs and a few resources to share as well. Before we get there, what is science communication? So here we're talking about the use of appropriate skills, media, activities, and dialogue to produce personal responses to science, called the AEIOU, Awareness, Enjoyment, Interest, Opinion Forming, and Understanding. Love when stuff like that just works out. You'll notice here that there's no indication of the platform that's used or the uh, person that's performing the science communication, and that's because it varies. So it can involve science practitioners, mediators, or journalists that are sharing, uh, that are translating knowledge, and the general public. There's no indication here of the flow of information. It can go in any direction within or between groups. So as I said, our survey tackled a few questions. Here I'm focused on the first. What is the perceived importance of science communication training? If you're interested in more, we also asked what science communication activities are most important and what are the most prominent gaps in science communication training? So you might be wondering who we asked and who our survey respondents are. And they were members of EcoDays, a workshop run by uh, or supported by ASLO and the NSF uh, in 2014. So we had 30 respondents from this workshop, which is an 85% response rate. All respondents uh, to the survey were early career aquatic scientists, so within a year of completing their PhD. 
I made a little uh, word art here to show the 20 disciplines that these 30 aquatic scientists come from, uh, lovingly arranged from salty to fresh and biological to physical chemical, with the larger words uh, being the more uh, popular, I guess you could say, um, disciplines. So the intended career trajectories of our survey respondents are diverse. So the most uh, so most of our respondents were looking into going into more than one possible, or had more than one possible career preference, with uh, academic research positions being the most popular. It is important to note, though, that only three of the respondents that were considering academic research positions were only considering that position. The rest were interested in other positions as well. Also of note are that 11 respondents were not interested in academic careers at all, so they did not choose it. So this is a relatively small uh, survey, but this information matches other data about career preferences with hundreds or even thousands of respondents, showing that uh, there is a diversity of intended career trajectories. So let's look at some of the data. First, what is the perceived importance of science communication training relative to other activities? So we asked our survey respondents to rank different kinds of professional development, which are listed along the bottom. And the higher that it plots, or the more blue, the, more, uh, the higher the ranking that, that participants gave it, or respondents gave it. So professional development around getting grants and funding was the most important, followed by lab training. After that, in-department curriculum, so for example, the coursework and science communication plotting here in the middle were very close to the same, which is interesting because uh, course, course curriculum or, in, or uh, program courses in grad programs are a, pr a mainstay of uh, most research graduate programs. Uh, lower than science communication was educational training, which again is a really important part of a lot of science careers, uh, and it also is a common part of grad training. On this graph, the most important thing that I want you to take from it is what the sources of science communication training were for those who did receive it. So science communication is broken up into a number of different categories here, but for all of them, essentially, their own university and self-guided uh, tutorial um, or self-guided training were the most common sources of science communication. So there's an opportunity, students are looking for it, they're getting at it from their own institution, and there's an opportunity to do it well. There were also a number of participants who did not participate in any one of, or in a number of these uh, different categories, for example, uh, oral presentation training or popular media training. And we asked them, why did you not participate in training? And the overwhelming response across all categories was, it wasn't offered, but they were interested. And this tells us that there's an unmet uh, demand for science communication training among graduate students. So in sum, from our research, survey respondents indicated that science communication training is important to them and that graduate students are interested in training that is not currently available to them. Additionally, from research that, we ha that I haven't shown in this presentation, we did find that departments and advisors are moderately supportive of science communication training and that graduate students lack opportunities to put that training into practice. So out of this work, uh, from the multiple choice and open-ended questions that we asked our participants, as well as from uh, the insights of our early career authors, we came up with three recommendations for incorporating science communication into grad training. First is to recognize the benefits of training, as it improves chances of obtaining funding for you and for your students. Recognize the benefits of a training because academic and non-academic research careers alike, alike depend on clear communication, and also because it provides water, wider visibility of institutions. If your students are doing well at their communicating their work, it's good for, the, for your department or your institution. Second, develop a strategy to support training that includes students and faculty in curriculum development. Include their voices when deciding what direction you're going to go in developing your strategy. Develop a strategy that provides and assesses authentic learning experiences and supports students taking advantage of existing training. So it's likely or possibly not about reinventing the wheel or necessarily about creating new programs, but it could be about encouraging access to existing programs as well. Finally, facilitate individualized approaches to science communication by providing opportunities that highlight students' strengths and improve on weaknesses that identify where best to focus efforts based on goals and target audience, 
and allow them to refine skills by communicating in authentic scenarios. So jumping back to uh, recommendation 2A, which was to involve students and faculty in curriculum development, uh, Bradley and I, uh, we um, modified something called a SOAR analysis, which is a way of identifying strategic direction for a uh, for program um, to focus on developing graduate professional training. And you can jot this down, but it's also on the little handout, so uh, the link there. Um, but this process really focuses on building on strengths and finding opportunities for uh, change in your graduate program. And most critically, it focuses on results. So while we can brainstorm uh, as much as we want, sometimes we brainstorm and then leave things um, to the side, results is about deciding on what metrics will tell us we're succeeding and then coming back to those to see how we're doing. So this SOAR analysis is included, uh, and I'm sorry I didn't give a uh, magnifying glass to go with the flyers, but um, it's, the links are included there. We also looked at a number of different types of graduate training that currently exist because although it's really important to start with the priorities of your graduate program, it's also of course a really good idea to see what others have already done. So I'm going to just very briefly talk about a few different examples and then more details including um, how they meet our recommendations are included uh, in the links that we provided. So one example is EPIC, which is, uh, which is a chemistry course in professional, um, in professional development uh, at my home institution of Western University in London and uh, Ontario, Canada. <laughs> it's critical, actually. Um, and it's this, this uh, course does really well at uh, meeting our recommendation of allowing for individual uh, professional development. It's a portfolio and reflection based course and it's built entirely around existing opportunities. So allowing students to choose from a menu of different training that already exists and giving them course credit um, and also really focusing on reflection. So continuously identifying how it's helping them meet their goals. Another example is CPSX which, at CPSX, which is the Center for Planetary Science and Exploration at Western University. An example of a program where science communication is embedded deeply into the grad program culture. So from undergrad to faculty member, uh, communicating about their science is, is in, deeply embedded uh, in that program. Most recently, graduate students were given opportunities to help write blog articles for David St. Jacques, who's at the International Space Station, um, and so they're given authentic practice on a regular basis and resources are put into that as well. Another really great example to think about are taking advantage of contracted workshops with SciCom experts. So you may not have the expertise in your own department, um, but programs like Compass and the workshops that are provided, for example, by ASLO, um, encouraging students to take advantage of these is a good way to give them that training, um, especially in cases where you might not have the expertise as, um, on your own. Finally, uh, partnerships between different programs, for example, um, the University of Pittsburgh postdoctoral post um, post training center has a, has a um, partnership with the Katz Business School and offers all of their postdocs MBA communication courses, which is a different uh, kind of training. Um, but given the, the number of stakeholders and so on that uh, P that PhD graduates may be expected to speak to, can be really valuable perspective. So with that, I do welcome you to check out our resources and. Uh, I left eight and a half seconds, so.